it is possible to transdifferentiate their gonad into that of the opposite sex. Hi everyone, how are we doing this morning? Good, that's what we like to hear. Excellent. This is a, quite a, a raucous title, isn't it, for like whatever, 10 o'clock on a, 11 o'clock on a, on a Saturday morning, the future of sex. Why am I here to talk to you about this? Um, because it's my favourite subject, basically. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm a molecular biologist, which means that I spend most of my life indoors, hiding away from the sun um, and doing experiments. And why the future of sex? Well, because um, I am lucky enough these days to study a subject that I find really, really interesting, which is to do with how ovaries are built. Um, so I study um, a process called uh, primary sex determination. Lots of things in science, as I'm sure you're aware, have these really jargony sounding names. But this one I actually quite like because sex determination kind of does what it says on the tin. It's about how sex, biological sex, is determined. So I study how it is that during embryonic development, an embryo is able to make a decision that shapes um, a part of its body into either becoming ovaries or testes. And in my case, why rather ovaries than testes? So I care more about the ovaries. Um, so again, this is a little bit of basic biology stuff at the beginning. I, I, I'm sorry for those of you who know this. I like to just remind everyone at the start of these kinds of conversations just so that we're all up to speed with the, the basics uh, and then we can get into the significantly hairier, for the lack of a better word, uh, part, parts later on. Um, <laughs> um, raucous, I said. Um, right, so let's cover the basics. Everyone in this room started off life as a single cell, one single cell. Um, it happens at the point at which um, your mother's biological mother's egg and your biological father's sperm met. Fertilization happens, and why do we care about this? That is the point at which um, the entire totality of something that we call your genome came into existence, okay? It's a collection of DNA. Um, basically, it's the totality of your genome that comes together. So that cell suddenly has this whole bunch of DNA in it that tells it what it's gonna do and how it's gonna behave and why it's gonna divide and why it's gonna do th these various different things that it's gonna do and how you're gonna end up looking the way you look right now, or the way I look the way right now. And one of the coolest things about that point, that moment in your life, that very first moment that all the bits of DNA that are going to help you become you come together is there's a whole dedicated book and chapter in that section that says, theoretically, you are going to become male or you are going to become female. So from the point of fertilization onwards, there's a chromosomal um, complement, it's called. You have sex chromosomes. You have a section of DNA that will theoretically at least, all things being well, mean that you are going to become a male or a female. Again, a bit of basic biology, I'm sure you all remember this. Females like myself, for example, carry two X chromosomes. I did actually get myself sequenced, I definitely have two of them. So we, we know this for a fact. And that's really interesting, I think. I think that in general. So before I had eyes, before I had hair the color that I had, before any of those things, in that moment, I was a potential human being, but it knew even from that point onwards, it had a set of DNA that was designed to make me supposedly female. Right, so then what happens? Well, embryonic development is really interesting. Another thing that I think is important <laughs> to mention at this point is the fact that as cells d divide, they all continue to carry that same genetic component. Your genome, those DNA, uh, pieces that we're talking about are found in every single cell in your body, okay? So from one cell to several trillion cells, maybe a few less in my case because I'm a bit short, but you know, I, every single cell in my body has that, same, has that same genome in it, okay? And as embryos develop, they kind of work a bit like how I think at least a sculptor maybe sculpts. So embryonic development is very uniform. So you and I would have looked very, very similar for the very first few weeks of development. Same with any of the gentlemen in the room as well. Everything's kind of the same for the first eight weeks. And then what happens at that point in time is this process of primary sex determination that I talked about, that I study, okay? So this embryo is kind of like a rough structure. It starts off as a mass. It gets the first thing that you have to decide if you're building, say, a statue of a human being, presumably, is which end is gonna be the head end and which end is gonna be the leg end. Um, and 
what happens is there's a part of the embryo that is called a bipotential gonadal ridge, which is a bit of a mouthful. But that will become, because it is bipotential, either the testes or the ovaries, okay? The sort of the same structure can actually become one or the other. And the thing that decides whether or not that's gonna happen is the sex chromosomes that I just mentioned, okay? So for eight weeks from the point of conception, those sex chromosomes have sat there. And some recent evidence suggests that there's a little bit of activity in relation to those sex chromosomes, but the main thing that they're there for is to wait for those eight weeks and then to kick into action. And at that point, what happens is, if you have a Y chromosome, which some of you in this audience do have, um, you have a gene called SRY, which kicks into action at that point, and it makes a little protein, and it basically instructs those cells to start building a testis. Okay? If that doesn't happen for any reason, right? if something's gone wrong with SRY, if anything's gone wrong with any of the other genes that are involved in this entire process, that will not happen. Okay? So I don't know how many of you in the room have heard about um, disorders of sex development, DSDs, intersex. These are things that people are starting to talk about a lot more in the public consciousness. Um, how does that happen? Well, that happens because there's something that I've just alluded to, which is, okay, fine, you might have these sex chromosomes to begin with, but it's not a simple process. There's many different genes involved. They're all working together as a team. They all have to work together well as a team to ensure that not only do, do the testes or the ovaries respectively form, but that they, they, they work properly, that they do their job. If any one of those players goes wrong, you can range from having um, sex reversal. So if you have no SRY, if that doesn't happen, for example, or another gene which is very important, if that doesn't activate and do its job properly in embryos that carry XY chromosomes, you can have something called a sex reversal, and it can be clean. It can be a neat, just that's it. It now is born looking like a female. Everything seems to be going fine. So humans, it's a bit more complicated than that. And it all needs to really work out really well because um, what we haven't discussed in this point, apart from the fact that I'm wittering on about my favorite organs in the, in the body, is the fact that gonads, so testes and ovaries, are really important because they are the seat of our future reproductive potential, right? That's where these magical cells sit and wait until their glorious moment comes at some point, probably used to be in our 20s nowadays, in our 30s for geriatric mothers and whatnot and all that kind of thing. But um, they wait, basically. Our gonads, testes and ovaries, are effectively like long-term long storage devices designed to hold your germ cells there, that's what they're called, the cells that will become either your sperm or your egg, and keep them ready to go, safe, away from the environment, ready to go only when they're required, okay? So, thinking about when I was talking about when things can go wrong, you can have some pretty extreme things go wrong, like the, the DSDs and these sort of intersex phenotypes that can happen where, you know, it can be either a complete sex reversal or things can go um, not to plan, let's put it this way, and you can end up with intermediary uh, statuses between male and female. But also you can end up in a situation where things only went a little bit wrong and maybe you don't find out about it until the day comes that you try and have a child and it hasn't quite gone to plan, okay? So that's kind of like the basics of what's happening in general. This is what we understand about, about sex, um, biological sex. I'm sorry to anyone who came here thinking about this is going to be about how like the physical sex is going to be looking in, in, in 20 years time with robots involved and all that stuff. It's pretty cool, but I'm not an expert in that at all. So go somewhere else for that, I'm afraid. Um, so, but I am interested in how it is that we're going to reproduce in the future, like physically, like in terms of, Will we, will we do it naturally? Or will we all be having children through IVF? Should we, shouldn't we? All these things. So that's what I'm gonna be covering today. Um, so let's, let's lay into this. Okay, so this is the basics that I've told you. One of the first conversations I had with my boss, and this is like, this is strap in basically, this is really cool. This is one of the first conversations I had with my boss when I was um, taking up my position um, as a postdoc. Um, that reminds me as well, sorry, I should say this. I'm here as myself, as an individual. I'm not representing my institution, which is the Francis Crick Institute. So whilst I am employed as a professional scientist, my opinions are my opinions, okay? Just so you all know. Okay, so 
This is the coolest thing I think I've heard in a very long time. Scientists like to do experiments, right? And I just told you DNA is really, really important. Well, how do you know something's really important? Like, really, really important. Like, if aliens came from outer space right now, okay, and they wanted to know, what are all these things that, are, that the, these human beings seem to be sort of hovering over? Are they important? How important are they? They might take the chairs away and see what happens. And would the event be disrupted? Maybe a little bit. You'd all stand, right? If the Wi-Fi in London went off or the electricity, we'd all bloody know about it, wouldn't we? And we'd be disrupted. So similarly to that, scientists do experiments where they take out sections of DNA to ask the question, how important is this piece of DNA? Now, something I haven't said explicitly is, of course, there's DNA, which is just the molecule that our genome is written in, and there's sections of interest, which are called genes. Specific genes make specific proteins. Proteins are like tools that cells can use. So we care about the genes, okay? So if I take a specific gene out of an embryo, let's say, before it is anything other than a single cell, at the very beginning, I take a gene out. And I say, I think this gene is going to be really important. Say, for example, that SRY gene that I mentioned sits on the Y chromosome. So if I take that gene out of the genome of an embryo that carries a Y chromosome, it no longer has that gene on it, right, in an experimental format. The proof that this gene is what makes that mouse, say, it's apparently unethical to do these things in humans. Um, <laughs> so we do it in a mouse. This mouse would, Therefore, according to what I've just told you, not be able to develop testes, right? And that's the proof. So by removing things, scientists are able to demonstrate, to prove experimentally something is of importance or not of importance, okay? Right, so here comes the fun fact. So embryos have these cells, they form these bipotential gonads, and then there's a whole program of genes that kick into action that tell those genes um, tell those cells, excuse me, that they should build a testis. And it used to be the case that we all thought that once a cell decides what it's going to do, it's made that decision, that's it, that's what it's doing. So recent work in um, other research laboratories, in mice, I have to say, have demonstrated that it is actually possible to remove DNA genes from those particular cells that form the bulk of, say, the testis. And if you remove one particular gene of interest from those cells, they apparently seem to forget that they're meant to be the cells of a testis. And they transdifferentiate within the gonad of the adult mouse into the uh, respective building blocks of an ovary instead. And they transdifferentiate the gonad from being a testis, say, into becoming more of an ovary. Now, this is not the reception I normally get. So to scientists, it's like, what are you talking about? Hang on a minute. Like, you're, so, you're like, right, when, when, when's the bomb getting dropped? Yeah. That was the bomb. <laughs> let, me, let me just repeat that so you all understand what I've just said to you. By removing a single gene in the gonad of an adult mouse, it is possible to transdifferentiate their gonad into that of the opposite sex. And the true, the, the same is, there we go, thank you, thank you, thank you, good grief, look at this. Um, I didn't do any of these experiments, so I shouldn't claim any of the credit. To continue but. watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.